Good evening uh, and welcome uh, to the first public program of 2022 for the Massachusetts Historical Society. For anyone who may be joining us for the first time, we are an independent nonprofit organization that maintains a research library and hosts a wide variety of programs on topics related to Massachusetts and American history. We are only able to produce these programs because of the support of our members, and we hope that you'll return for future events as well as seminars, and we hope that you will uh, support our work by becoming a member or making a donation to support uh, the MHS. Uh, this evening, we are joined by Reed Gutschberg, uh, who will be presenting on her book, Useful Objects, Museums, Science, and Literature in 19th Century America. After a short introduction to the work, she will be joined in conversation by MHS's own Sarah Giorgini. Useful Objects examines the history of American museums during the 19th century through the eyes of visitors, writers, and collectors. Museums of this period held a wide range of uh, objects from botanical and zoological specimens to antiquarian artifacts and technological models. Uh, they were intended to promote useful knowledge. These collections uh, generated broad, broader discussions about how objects were selected, preserved, and classified, as well as who gets to decide their value. These reflections shaped broader debates about the scope and purpose of museums in American culture that continue to resonate today. Uh, Ms. Gutschberg is the Assistant uh, Director of Studies and, and a lecturer on history and literature at Harvard University. She's taught seminars and tutorials on museums in America, museums and material culture, and science exploration and empire. Her research and teaching focus on 19th century American literature and culture, with particular interest in material culture, museum studies, and the history of science and technology. She received her PhD in English from Boston University and her undergraduate degree from Harvard. Uh, she will be joined by uh, MHS's own Sarah Giorgini, uh, who is probably a familiar face to any, many of our regulars. She is the series editor for the Papers of John Adams, part of the Adams Papers editorial project based at the Massachusetts Historical Society. She is the author of Household Gods, The Religious Lives of the Adams Family, um, and frequently writes about early America, early American thought and culture for the Smithsonian. Similar to Ms. Gutschberg, she also received her PhD from Boston University. So without further ado, uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Ms. Gutschberg. Well, great. Thank you so much, uh, Gavin, for that introduction. Um, and thank you so much to all of you for being here tonight. Um, I'm so grateful to the Massachusetts Historical Society for hosting me. Um, and I'm really looking forward to my conversation with Sarah Giorgini. Um, and I also especially want to thank um, Gavin Clistes and Olivia Saya for organizing this event. Um, it's really just a pleasure to be here and have the chance to share my work on the history of museums with this community. And I'm really grateful to all of you for taking the time to listen in and join in this conversation. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen to get us started. And I want to start out with a strange and perhaps surprising story from the early history of American museums. So some of you might be familiar with the work of Charles Wilson Peale, who was a portrait painter, naturalist, and museum entrepreneur in Philadelphia in the late 18th century. Um, Peale established one of the earliest American museums during the 1780s, and he combined collections of his own portraits and works of art with natural history and anthropology, as well as lectures, demonstrations, and other forms of popular entertainment. But in 1792, Peel was hoping to get some more funding for his museum, um, and he issued a broad appeal to the citizens of Philadelphia and addressed members of the American Philosophical Society, which is a learned scientific organization in the city, in order to make the case for his museum and implicitly, of course, to attract some donations. Um, so Peel devotes most of his energy in this, in this work to describing the range of his collections and their potential for educating citizens of the Republic. Um, he also emphasizes the practical and logistical aspects of running a museum, including, you know, the costs of gilt frames and glass cases that he's going to need to acquire. Um, and it's a really fascinating document just for thinking about what it meant to start a museum during this time. But Peel also takes this conversation a step further. So as part of this proposal, he talks his audience through the process of preservation that he was using on mammals and birds. But the tone of his message shifts pretty dramatically when he suggests extending these methods of preservation to the founding fathers themselves. He suggests, quote, there are other means to preserve and hand down to succeeding generations. 
the relics of such great men whose labors have been crowned with success in the most distinguished benefits to mankind. The mode I mean is the preserving their bodies from corruption by the use of powerful antiseptics. So Peel goes on to note that he's pretty sure that Benjamin Franklin would be on board with this idea, and he's imagining how these um, specimens could add to the collections of natural history that he's assembling in his museum. So on the one hand, this strange and radical proposal to taxidermy Benjamin Franklin um, allows us to see some of the anxieties of the early Republic, um, and especially at this moment where there's, there's a lot of fear of political instability as you know, the, the luminaries, the, the most visible figures of the nation's founders would, were no longer alive and in full view of American citizens. But it also allows us to see how Peel and his contemporaries were imagining the role that museums and cultural institutions could play within the social and intellectual life of the nation. What should they collect, preserve, and display? How might material objects be part of a process of constructing knowledge about history, science, and culture? And who will participate in determining what we choose to hold in our sight and value? So these kinds of questions were really central to the early history of American museums as I explore more broadly in my book and we'll say a little bit more about tonight. Um, I wanna emphasize a few larger ideas. So first, just about the kinds of shifts that were taking place during the late 18th and early 19th century and the scope and mission of museums. Um, second, also about the, the broader challenges and debates that surrounded collections that we can see through the accounts of the writers and artists and visitors who were engaging with them. And finally, I wanna say a little bit about the contemporary stakes of these conversations for museums and cultural institutions today. Um, I'll offer a few examples just to think through some of these larger issues before turning back to one early example in a bit more detail. Um, and towards the end, I'm also gonna say a little bit about how some of these ideas also informed the early history of the collections here at the MHS. So museums have a fascinating, complicated, and often troubling history. Scholars commonly trace the, the history of museums back to early modern Europe, when individual collectors created cabinets of curiosities filled with a wide range of natural history specimens, artifacts, other objects returned from voyages around the world. Um, the rise of colonialism really shaped this idea of curiosity. It, it often stood in for otherness, um, for a Eurocentric view of the world, as well as for this process of discovery and knowledge making. Um, to these collectors, such objects were rare. Um, curiosity really was in the eye of the beholder, as we see here in this image. Um, as time went on, many collectors were increasingly looking to have representative as well as rare objects as part of their collections um, in order to achieve what one called a world in miniature, an encyclopedic, encyclopedic collection that, that could allow for the study of all branches of knowledge. So during the 18th century, these individual collections would form the basis of more public, large, large scale institutions like the British Museum. Um, around the same time, uh, many royal collections of art were being turned into public institutions like the Louvre and the National Gallery. Um, and these institutions were really important models for the kinds of museums that were established in the United States. Um, it wasn't until later in the 19th century that we see the rise of museums that might be familiar to us today, like the MFA here in Boston, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the American Museum of Natural History. These were all founded around the, the 1870s following the Civil War. Um, but I've been really interested in this kind of in-between moment between the 18th century and, and these later museums where we can really see this kind of gradual, messy, non-linear transition between a kind of cabinet of curiosities model where you have collections that are filled with all kinds of different objects together towards greater specialization. Um, and also between collections that were often restricted for elite audiences or imagined to have a research purpose towards institutions that were dedicated at least ostensibly to public education and access. So, by examining in this, this period in more detail, um, I also wanna argue that, that we can see also more clearly that the idea of a museum itself was in flux. Um, you can see this actually in the, the different terms that were used to describe collections during this period. Um, you often see terms like cabinet or gallery or museum that, that all mean an object collection um, and different purposes for it. Um, these were often housed in, in different locations too, um, from libraries and historical societies to academies, lyceums and colleges. Um, but across these different contexts, we can see a lot of resonances and how their purpose was being imagined. 
Um, the founders of these institutions often wrote down and shared their mission, whether through acts of incorporation or other written documents. Um, and they often emphasize this idea of useful knowledge, suggesting how material objects themselves can make knowledge itself more tangible and concrete. Um, and additionally, they, they make lofty claims about a broader mission of research and education. Museums were committing to preserving objects for posterity, and they promised a kind of democratic access to knowledge, even if things didn't always play out this way, as I'll say more about in a few minutes. So in order to look at this history, um, I've drawn on my own background as a literary scholar in order to trace accounts of museums across fiction, essays, guidebooks, and periodicals, and also to put these, these descriptions in conversation with the kinds of information that we can get from donation books, um, visual materials, and even surviving objects and collections. Um, one thing I, I wanna say about this period is that it really kind of demands this, this interdisciplinary approach. Um, on the one hand, museums museums were, were bringing together so many different types of objects and what we today would consider to be different fields, you know, botany, geology, zoology, um, anthropology, history, geography. Um, and we can see in, in these collections um, a kind of crisscrossing, intersecting paths of objects and individuals and institutions. Um, but I also want to note that if we look at this history through the eyes of the people who were engaging with these collections, we can also see how they were inviting different kinds of creative, imaginative responses um, as visitors were reflecting on what they were seeing and also sometimes considering potential alternatives. So one thing that we can see very clearly is how museums um, we're creating different hierarchies and power dynamics that were linked to colonialism and elitism um, about who would have access to the kinds of knowledge that were represented in their collections. So we can see this in, in the writings of Jane Johnston Schoolcraft, who was a Native American poet um, who actually was married to a Bureau of Indian Affairs agent. And they, they collaborated together. And in his case, he appropriated many of her writings um, as part of a larger project um, on early anthropology in the United States. And we can see in her writings though, how she's reflecting on the relationship between white and indigenous forms of knowledge making. Um, and we can also see figures like the black abolitionist and activist, William Wells Brown, who was interpreting works of classical sculpture in the galleries of the British Museum and really staking a claim to his right to an education and, and to his own expertise. Um, but we can also see figures like Ora White Hitchcock, who was um, a really talented artist and natural history illustrator who, you know, when visiting these collections was, was sometimes reflecting on the fact that, you know, her husband and son were likely to, to benefit more from them than she might. So these accounts allow us to really trace the, the people who were, who were engaging in visiting museum collections to think beyond what institutions were promising or claiming to offer, but also to see how people are reflecting on their own place within, within these institutions and, and really kind of challenging the, the limits of, of what was being defined as, as useful knowledge during this period. Um, the imaginative responses of writers also help us to illuminate the kinds of challenges and bigger questions that, that museums were raising. Um, in the early Republic, um, the French-born writer and diplomat, um, Hector Saint-Jean de Crevecoeur, really reflected on these challenges of materiality and loss and, and was really imagining the precarity of the objects that, that were circulating and being exchanged by institutions. Um, in the galleries of the US Patent Office, surrounded by models of pat patented machines, the poet Walt Whitman confronted this strange and really horrific spectacle of a museum transformed into a civil war hospital. Um, and he captures in his writings, this eerie scene of, of these cases of objects interspersed with wounded soldiers. Um, and the writer and naturalist Henry David Thoreau mourned his decision to kill a turtle in order to donate it to Harvard's Natural History Museum, even as he recognized its potential value to scientific research. So the founders of museums often envisioned order, right? They pictured these collections neatly arranged in cases and cabinets, but the reality was a much more disorderly process that spurred really dynamic conversations both within and beyond institutions. 
about what we choose to preserve and value, about whose knowledge and expertise is celebrated or erased, and about who has access to the knowledge and education represented by cultural institutions. These questions continue to resonate in discussions about these institutions today, and my hope is that understanding the longer history of these issues can help us think creatively about how to interpret objects that were collected, collected during this time, and also can inform how we think about making cultural institutions more interdisciplinary, inclusive, and community-oriented spaces today. So with some of these larger issues in mind, I just wanna come back to um, an early example of how museums were defining and redefining the purpose of collections. Um, I mentioned Peel's Museum at the beginning, um, and I wanna put that museum in conversation with another extremely nearby collection, which was the Cabinet of the American Philosophical Society. So the APS was founded in the mid 18th century by Benjamin Franklin with the goal of preserving and promoting useful knowledge. Much like other learned societies and institutions, especially the Royal Society in London, um, on which it was modeling a lot of its activities, um, the APS had a few ways that they thought to do that. So first, they planned to meet regularly and gather information from a network of correspondents around the Atlantic world um, and publish scholarly articles about their research. Um, they, they plan to form a library. And finally, they established a cabinet. So like other early cabinets of curiosity, um, the APS cabinet held a wide variety of types of objects, an herbarium of pressed plants, um, natural specimens, anthropological artifacts, and other objects that were sent from around the Atlantic world. The APS was not alone in developing this kind of collection alongside its library. So here in the greater Boston area, there were numerous examples of this pattern. So the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, um, the Boston Athenaeum, the American Antiquarian Society, and of course the MHS, all of these institutions also had cabinets that looked very similar to the one at the APS. Um, around this time, um, Harvard College also had what was called a philosophy chamber. And um, this was a, a kind of teaching collection that, that similarly included, you know, a range of different kinds of objects as, such as natural specimens, artifacts, but also um, scientific instruments. Um, and this was the subject of a really great exhibit um, a few years ago at the Harvard Art Museums. And you can actually still access a, a virtual version of that through their website if you're interested. So these collections don't get discussed as often as something like Peel's Museum. Um, they were more short-lived, um, they were less popular with visitors, and they were definitely more tied to elite scientific communities. But they're nonetheless really important to how we understand the kinds of museums that were being founded during this period and how people were understanding the, the point of developing a collection like this. So on the one hand, you have, you know, the drama, the spectacle of, of Peel's self-portrait, right? Lifting, lifting the velvet curtain to, to show the mammoth skeleton. Um, and on the other hand, you have these collections that were explicitly intended for research and, and designed to function in some ways like a library. Um, these kinds of institutions were really um, evolving alongside each other and even overlapped at times. Um, and they, they reveal the kind of twinned purposes of museums as they were um, evolving during this very transitional moment. So the APS cabinet was explicitly wide ranging in the kinds of objects it collected. Um, in some ways, this was the result of a kind of haphazard collecting process. Um, objects were often sent to the society by what were called corresponding members. So these were people who did not live in Philadelphia, but um, lived elsewhere and would send objects and letters um, and other information um, to contribute to this larger enterprise. Um, the term cabinet was also something of, of a misnomer. Um, the society frequently struggled to find space to house its collections and objects actually were often loaned out to the members who lived in Philadelphia. Um, as a result, they're scattered, they were circulating um, and they were, they were not necessarily held in one place as, as a term like cabinet might suggest. Um, this posed fairly obvious organizational challenges. Um, at one point, the curators announced um, kind of ruefully that the objects had been, quote, entrusted to the care of members, but never yet delivered to the society. So things got lost. To some extent, I think this really speaks to a different imagined purpose for a museum than, than what we think of today. So at this point, the, the, the point was using and handling and observing these objects um, rather than trying to kind of keep them perfectly preserved. Um, they were also entrusted to people who were known to be interested in that field, to be working on related projects. Um, and the goal was to use the collection to really 
contribute to, to knowledge through this research. Um, preservation, longevity were not major concerns, um, even if it means that the collections did not survive that long. Um, however, I also want to note that some of these issues of loss and preservation were especially significant during the, the period of time that this collection was being formed, um, which overlapped with the American Revolution and early Republic. Um, so during the war, the curators actually reported the decay of many specimens in the collection. Um, their attention was obviously elsewhere. Um, and some collections dried out due to you know, running out of alcohol to fill jars with specimens um, or to preserve things properly. And following the war, things actually stayed fairly chaotic. Um, the APS was looking to build a more permanent space and the collections continued to move around. So here's where we come back to Peel and his museum and his promise to be really good at preserving things. Um, Peel was a member of the APS um, and he had begun his own museum out of his own house. Um, but by the early 1790s, he was looking for more space. Um, his proposal to, to taxidermy Ben Franklin was, was part of this broader self-promotion. Um, and he was really outlining the kinds of work that he had done that he, was, that he had been able to achieve at his museum so far and, and looking for additional funds. Um, in 1794, Peel was also simultaneously the curator of the APS cabinet. And at this moment, he applied for permission to rent space from the society in Philosophical Hall um, in order to open up his museum there. So given his dual roles, it's highly likely that he was also displaying some of the APS cabinet's collections alongside and within his own museum. So here we see the Learned Society and the Public Museum really kind of coming into contact. So this was not without some anxieties, especially on the side of the APS. Um, one of the largest specimens in the society's cabinet, um, a skeleton of an Indian elephant was placed on display at Peel's museum. But the society was very careful to note that they preferred quote, a handsome and suitable inscription to show that it was placed there as best calculated to answer the purpose for which it was desired. Um, there's a little scuffle in the meeting minutes about this decision. Um, someone felt the need to note that this decision was reached uh, after maturely weighing all circumstances, which is never a good sign. Um, and this collaboration was just clearly an uneasy one, largely due to competing ideas about the purpose of these collections. So Peel's museum on the one hand would continue to expand. Um, soon he would move across the hall or across the street to the larger rooms of Independence Hall, um, achieving at least temporarily his goal of developing a national museum. Um, meanwhile, the cabinet of the APS would continue to, to kind of fizzle. Um, there are descriptions of the elephant skeleton and mammoth bones collecting dust in the cellar um, and other accounts of the society being crowded with articles. Um, and the later history of this cabinet was really um, shaped by the rise of disciplinary specialization. So as the 19th century wore on, museums tended to become more specialized to break into institutions dedicated to art, natural history, technology, and so forth, and to be separated off from libraries. Um, most of the objects that remained in the APS cabinet um, were sent either to the Penn Museum in the case of anthropological collections, or to the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia for many of the natural history specimens. Um, and here in the greater Boston area, we see a similar pattern where many of the anthropological artifacts that were donated to the Antiquarian Society, the Athenaeum or the MHS are now at the Peabody Museum at Harvard. So although these collections are now separate, they were once housed together. And I really wanna emphasize how important it is for us to recognize that early history. Um, we can better see the kinds of concerns and anxieties that were hugely influential in shaping the trajectory of museums through the present day. Um, we can imagine and put in conversation the different points of view among founders and visitors. Um, and we can also recognize the shared history of collections that were dedicated to science and history and art, even if today they're at separate institutions. Um, this can allow us to imagine different ways of interpreting these objects and, and understanding how they were valued and used, who collected them and how they ended up at different institutions. Um, it also can allow us to acknowledge the forms of loss and erasure that occurred in, in the founding of these institutions to find new ways to highlight the voices of figures who were excluded from these conversations and, and to think about ways to connect collections from across a wide range of fields. So in that way, perhaps there are opportunities too for us to, to build on and expand the possibilities for engaging with museum collections today. 
Um, the founders of 19th century museums often had a kind of shared set of language and metaphors that they used um, to talk about their goals. Um, they often like to imagine the spark that could result from placing different objects in fields of knowledge and conversation. Um, and they sometimes describe this process of ideas and collision between different objects and, and among the different minds and perspectives of those engaging with them. Um, throughout this period, the range of objects that were housed in museum collections really spurred many visitors to imagine continued possibilities for drawing new kinds of connections. But the founding of museums also set in motion larger and still unresolved conversations about how we determine what to value, study, and preserve. So my hope is that this history can help us understand the role that these collections can play today. Um, much like the transitional moment of the 19th century, museums and cultural institutions have been in a fairly long moment of crisis and transition, especially over the past two years. Um, but this means it's also a dynamic moment for thinking about how the priorities of institutions can continue to evolve and change and how museums, libraries, and archives can continue to be creative about interdisciplinary and inclusive forms of interpretation and education and imagine how they can find new opportunities for making collections more useful. So with that, um, I'd like to invite Sarah to, to join me um, and to um, continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Reed, and thanks to all of you for joining us here tonight. Please, if you have a question, drop it in the Q&A and we'll get to as many as we can. Reed, your book struck a chord with me from page one, talking about circulating objects and how we use them to respond and reflect. It made me think particularly of a new exhibit that we've launched here um, in the building, an online view of our favorite things. And that really helped us connect during the pandemic, sharing some of our favorites in the collections. But we also thought about how to make it accessible. And that leads to my first question, which is what were the nuts and bolts of actually accessing these collections? Were there tickets, admission fees, experts on hand to answer questions? What was it like? That, was, that is such a great question. I mean, one thing I would emphasize is that it just varied so much depending on the, the museum and depending on the collection, right? So you have something like Teal's Museum that's really geared towards a broader public and there were tickets and you can actually see those in the archives. Um, there were guidebooks um, and Peel and his sons would often be on hand um, to answer questions, to do demonstrations. Um, visitors to the museum could even have a silhouette drawn um, as a kind of souvenir. Um, but it really, it really varied a lot. Um, so, you know, another museum I talk about in the book is the, the U.S. Patent Office Gallery. And I think this, this museum is such a, a strange mix of different purposes because, you know, the Patent Office was, of course, like a federal bureaucratic office, but they created this gallery in order to house and display um, these miniature models that inventors submitted along with their patent applications. So by the mid-19th century, they had thousands of these, and they, they built um, what's now the Smithsonian American Art Museum and National Portrait Gallery building um, in order to put these on display for the public. But, you know, if you imagine people visiting this gallery, they could purchase a guidebook, but there would also be a lot of different people interacting with these objects at once. You would have patent office clerks and examiners who are using these to, um, to adjudicate you know, competing claims to, to the novelty of an invention, but you also would have visitors to, to this gallery kind of alongside each other. Um, and I guess finally, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning that you know, a number of these museums were attached to, to different kinds of educational institutions. So whether that's an academy or, or even a college and university. Um, and so, you know, for example, at Harvard, the, the Museum of Comparative Zoology, which was founded in, in 1859, um, there were numerous students who worked there, um, you know, spending hours and hours comparing, um, you know, specimens in the collections. But um, you also had these women assistants who were who are working closely with the collections to catalog and classify these objects. So it really it really ranged. Um, and I think in terms of visitors, like I think these guidebooks are really important to how we can imagine what the experience might have been like of visiting the museum. But you know the. There's also so much that you can glean even from, from newspaper accounts and, and descriptions of, of visits to these spaces as well. So I think that they would have learned about these in, in a number of different ways. Something that comes through throughout the book is this idea 
that curatorial work is an art and a science. And I want to step back to something you mentioned, which is this technique that early curators had of placing ideas in collision, that somehow this sparked useful knowledge. Can you give us some examples of that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's such an interesting idea because in some ways, like it's, it is this, this lofty promise, right? I mean, I think it's this idea that by putting together, you know, works of art alongside, you know, natural history or alongside anthropology, that you'll be able to kind of, um, you know, generate new kinds of ideas, generate new, new kinds of knowledge that will be somehow useful. But, you know, I think part of why I was drawn to that term, especially for the book's title is that, you know, it raises all these questions of useful to whom and for whom and also you know what about useless knowledge like what do you what do you do with that um and so i think what i've i've been especially interested in the kind of unexpected nature of that process of of collision that you're asking about right like where you know you can glimpse how people are are resisting some of these categories of usefulness right like you can see a figure like Henry David Thoreau writing in his journals, I hate museums, they are dead nature collected by dead men, right? That there's, that there's beyond what the, the founders of these museums are, are saying about what they're trying to do, we can, we can really access um, the thoughts and experiences of people who, you know, might be thinking in, in other ways about, you know, what knowledge looks like and, and what should be included or not. Um, and I guess like the, the last thing I'd say about that is, you know, curators might imagine this kind of official route to creating knowledge within a museum collection. But of course, we know that there would be things left out, stories not told. Um, and I think that those kinds of issues and questions really resonate a lot across a lot of the, a lot of different institutions during this period. Yeah, and I think the idea that museum making as a cultural process is so integral to those first years of the early Republic. What are some of the ways that these institutions buttress or shape American federal growth and even American identity? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, museums were explicitly tied to national expansion, right? And I I think often the idea of useful knowledge was really part of this idea of, you know, learning more about some field that would enable greater economic development or expand information about newly annexed territories as, you know, the United States is evolving into an empire very quickly, Um, especially in the first half of the 19th century. You see this a lot with geology. Um, I've noticed that that often is tied to, you know, U.S. geological surveys, um, cartography expeditions um, in, you know, the Great Lakes region in the West. Um, The other thing I would say is that museum founders were predominantly white, elite, um, educated men. Um, But there are also these stories and figures who kind of complicate this pattern. So I mentioned earlier Jane Johnston Schoolcraft. Um, So her husband was Henry Rose Schoolcraft, and he was a Bureau of Indian Affairs agent and the author of numerous books on what was called then ethnology, right? He's an early, early anthropologist. Um, and he's studying, um, he was especially interested in geology, but he also was very interested in collecting um, what he called specimens of folklore. So he was looking to write down and record legends. And he worked with his wife, who was um, of Native American descent, and her family to, to collect information. And a lot of his writings actually became major sources for, for figures like Longfellow, um, for James Fenimore Cooper. Um, but you know, one thing I think is really important is that like you can see this dynamic process like if you read his some of his writings you can occasionally kind of glimpse her voice coming through um you know and in her own writings because she was a poet herself she's she's sometimes writing explicitly about and reflecting on this relationship between white and indigenous forms of knowledge but ideas of expertise and sovereignty so you know this collaboration i think is a really interesting one both for how it overlaps with the kinds of you know, rhetoric used to talk about museum collections and, and knowledge gathering during this period, but also for how it really maps on to um, national expansion, especially during, you know, the 1820s and 1830s. One of the great contributions and challenges of writing a book that stretches for a century is thinking about how the turning points change, right? So I'm thinking particularly since you have a 19th century story of the Civil War and how museums and their makers 
are shaped by or shape our memory of the Civil War. What did you find there? Yeah, I mean, so actually what's interesting is that 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 part of the book was actually my my starting point um, when I began um, researching this project. So um, I mentioned earlier this this really amazing sketch by Walt Whitman when he's serving as a Civil War nurse um, and he visits the Patton Office Gallery when it's transformed into a temporary hospital. And he describes it as this strange and fascinating site where you can see these cases of models and you can see wounded soldiers. And I think when I started with this um, with this moment, I, I, I was kind of imagining that I would then read forward in time um, mm-hmm. and to kind of start here and look at some of the, the large scale museums that were founded and, you know, following the Civil War, you know, these, the, the, the corporate tycoon have funded institutions like, you know, many art museums and natural history museums that exist today. But one thing that I found actually was that, um, I ended up just continuing to read backwards. So, you know, looking at the patent office gallery and starting to, to kind of dig, dig deeper into its earlier history. And, you know, this, this transformation of this institution from, you know, the 1830s onward. And then kind of from there, I ended up kind of working, working backwards in a way, because I realized that um, just as I kept working, this story just, just, just continued to kind of evolve out of my research of, of this, this transitional period, right? That um, in order to kind of get a sense of how we, um, how we moved from these institutions that were so, um, so varied in there in the kinds of things they were collecting and like this mix of, of so many different objects and purposes together to these, these institutions that, you know, actually looked very similar to the kinds of museums we might visit today. Um, you know, I really, I really did kind of notice this overall kind of turning point as you're, as you're saying in, in that, in the first half of the, the century. But, you know, I think your question about the Civil War is a really interesting one because it was just this, this, I think it is the kind of next shift in that, in that turn. Um, And I think in the book, I explore it primarily through, you know, Whitman's experience within the patent office. Um, But I think that, um, you know, I think that it is this really, really significant moment in terms of how we, how we then think about where, where these institutions go next. And thinking about how you constructed your chronology, I've got to stay on craft for just a minute here. So if we can just talk about historical process and research, because we love to geek out and do that here at the MHS. Um, Can you talk a little bit about researching and representing some of the rich cast of characters that you cover in useful objects. So I'm thinking of people who are perhaps very well known, like William Wells Brown, and people who are less well known, like Ora White Hitchcock. How do you find them in the archives? And how do you situate their story within all of these amazing different networks, cultural, political, and the museums that they roam through? Yeah. Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, I'm sure you and I could could talk about this for for hours, right? But I mean, I think that I think one of the challenges of of writing a story like this one is that I, I do think that the voices that tend to dominate this history are going to be those of white men. Um, they're going to be the ones founding these institutions and having you know the most access to to visiting them, to being part of some of these societies and organizations, and so forth. Um, and so that was definitely something I was thinking about a lot in in my own work. And I think that you know, in some ways, the short answer to your question is you know I think I, that I I really prioritized going going looking for for some of these voices. Um, but I mean, I think that, you know, one thing I would say just about these source materials is that I also think it's really important to be putting a lot of different kinds of materials in conversation with each other, because that's the way you can really access these stories. So, you know, for example, I mean, Hitchcock's, I talk a lot about Hitchcock's diaries and her writings um, in this piece, but really what she's best known for are her drawings and illustrations. So she was the wife of an Amherst College professor, Edward Hitchcock, who was a geologist, but she did all of the illustrations for his published writings. She created these amazing classroom drawings. Um, And I mean, I think when I, 
when I was able to look at her diary, which is a really fascinating account of her, of their visit together to, it's a tour of England and Scotland. Um, she, she tagged along when he was going to an academic conference. Um, and she, you know, she talks about her visits to these galleries, but there's this moment where she's talking about this really amazing natural history collection. And she writes in her diary, you know, I thought of Edward and how much he would benefit from it. And it's, it's this kind of, I don't know, she's sort of being timid in a way about sort of acknowledging her own expertise. I mean, she's this really talented illustrator. She had so much knowledge herself, but I think it's also in, in some ways a very realistic admission of how she kind of understood, you know, her own place within, within these communities. And it's kind of sad, sad moment. Um, but, you know, I also think just looking at her writings um, also in relation to the kinds of stories and, and, um, anecdotes that you can find in newspapers and periodicals. Um, you know, one that comes to mind, um, there's this story that got reprinted a lot in the first few decades of the 19th century. It was called Female Character, A Lesson. Um, and it tells the story of, you know, a young woman visiting the British Museum and how she's misbehaving um, and gets scolded by someone else on her tour. And like the whole point of the story is to, you know, trace the evolution of her moral character as she learns herself. Um, but, you know, when you read that alongside, you know, Hitchcock's diary or alongside the writings of someone like William Wells Brown, you know, you can really see how they're, they're kind of participating in this broader conversation about what it means to be a visitor to one of these spaces and what it means to be someone who's, who's trying to kind of claim, um, you know, claim an equal, equal right to, to be part of, of this conversation and to assert their own knowledge and expertise. So, this has been a very long uh, digression, probably from your original question, but, you know, I think that it was really important to me to, to think about how we could, we could really put these different kinds of sources together, how we could see how some of these conversations are circulating in different ways across things like fish, fiction and poetry, but also through, you know, visual and material objects as well as written sources, um, because I think that that's also an opportunity in terms of, you know, future projects for to think more broadly about, you know, how we expand this history, how we think about who is collecting and donating to, to these museums, as well as visiting too. And it seems like American Victorians who began the century in love with the British model of museums have changed their minds a little bit by the end of the century. They travel, they go abroad, and the British Museum isn't exactly what they expected. How does that shift happen? I mean, I think that it's a really, I think the British Museum especially, um, it's this really interesting contrast to what Americans are seeing in museums here in the United States. So, I mean, there's this contrast between a museum dedicated really to, to archaeology. Um, you know, Hawthorne talks about seeing all the fragments um, of the classical sculptures there. Um, and a national museum like the Patent Office that's displaying these, you know, shiny model machines, right? And so I think that there are, there are different ways that, that some of these national museums are are cultivating um, their own identity and their own mission. Um, that in the U.S. to have a museum like the Patent Office is to really emphasize like American ingenuity and loyalty. Um, but you know, I think for all that Americans are, you know, critical of the British Museum in the mid nineteenth century, I, I still think that it's a really it stays a really important example because I think some of the, the criticism is just protesting too much, right? That there's there's a kind of anxiety of, oh, they have so much here. How can we ever have as much in our own museums? Um, and I think that that carries over as well to, to science museums. I think you see natural history museums that are very much modeling themselves on um, institutions in Europe and, and really seeking to be part of this kind of larger process of, of exchange um, and, and really trying to build these, these encyclopedic collections that can compete um, with, with the institutions that are already more well-established in Europe. So I think that, that that pattern really carries on. And I think that it, it really continues, especially with the, the founding of, of some of these later, more, more specialized museums too. Mm. Well, in the spirit of history and dialogue, I think we should open it up to our brilliant audience. We have a number of questions bubbling away. Please add yours in the next couple of minutes. And Reed, we're just gonna dive in. So- Sounds great. <laughs> 
First up, do you have a favorite old cabinet or museum that still exists in some form today for visiting? Oh, that's such an interesting question. Um, I would say, you know, I would say that I've really appreciated a lot of, you know, recent curatorial projects that, that, um, that are, are kind of thinking explicitly about this history and tradition. So, um, you know, I think about the British Museum, they have their Enlightenment Gallery, where they've, you know, brought together a lot of the, the collections from the 18th century. I, you know, when I was there several years ago, um, I spent a lot of time, um, you know, wandering that gallery. Um, but I also, you know, I'm really intrigued by kind of more, more recent works by, I'm just thinking like contemporary artists like Mark Dion's work. Um, there was a great ICA exhibition a few years ago, but, you know, a lot of his work is really kind of engaging explicitly in, in the history of science. Um, and he creates kind of reimagined cabinets of curiosities, you know, reimagining some of these spaces as well um, that I think um, kind of allow us to, to think about some of these, these questions in new ways. So I definitely recommend that to anyone who, who is interested. That's interesting, I didn't know. So you've introduced me to a new artist, thank you. Um, another audience member would like to know, to what extent was research an objective in the founding of the early museums? And was there any public funding of the early institutions? Yeah, I mean, I think research was, really was a primary objective for a lot of these these institutions. And I think that you see that across um, you know, what we now think of, you know, the, the different fields, right? I think that that was true at um, the American Philosophical Society. I think that was definitely true um, at the MHS as well, right? I mean, I think this idea of um, publishing, publishing your work and kind of promoting it in that way was, was really important to any of these institutions that were kind of trying to, to collect and record um, information, whether that was about natural history or a American history. Um, in terms of funding, I mean, I think that many of these institutions tended to be privately funded. So um, really until you get to the Smithsonian. So I think, and even that was the result of a bequest to the U.S. government by, by James Smithson. So I think that from the start, the, the question of funding has been a really tricky one um, within um, the United States for a lot of these museums. Um, and you see a lot of them evolving as private institutions as, as a result. Lots to say yeah. about that question. I think that's such an interesting question. I just have to add, because it's something that I've been thinking about a lot as we annotate the next volume of the Adams papers here, is that John Adams is the president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences for a long amount of time, at the same time that Thomas Jefferson is president of the American Philosophical Society. And I would, I would love for someone to go forth and write about those two presidencies and the scientific networks generated. Um, that's just- Yeah, absolutely. To researchers. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, Jefferson is president of the American Philosophical Society at the same time that he's president of the US. So he's president of both at the same time that um, the he's um, commissioning the Lewis and Clark expedition. Mm -hmm. And um, he actually has members of the APS, you know, work with Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to help train them in, in you know, um, surveying and botany and so forth. And so as you're saying, I think it'd be, that would be a great project. It's fascinating. I mean, if you look at the election of 1796, Jefferson is just writing, but I'm on the Hessian fly committee. That's way more interesting. Um, so I think looking at the scientific pursuits of the founders is, is such a rich topic to explore. Okay, back to our chat and our wonderful questions. Let's see, was there a museum or cabinet that particularly surprised you in the course of your research? Yeah, I think... I mean, I think all of them did, to be quite honest. I think that was part of the, the pleasure of this project to a great extent was um, how, you know, how many kind of unexpected moments um, were, were part of that research. Um, I mean, I think the, the example that I, that I spoke at the most length about the, the American Philosophical Society cabinet, that, that's one that's really stayed with me because I do think that, you know, the idea of this museum collection that doesn't have a physical space and doesn't have a gallery um, where the objects are scattered, where things are getting lost. I think that that's, that's one that 
really stayed with me as part of how we even really think about the narrative of what it means to be a museum and like what the goal of these institutions are, because I think that, you know, we think so much about preservation and what's getting recorded. Um, but also I think that, you know, these histories of loss are, are just as important to how we think about museums. And I guess related to that, um, you know, within, within Peel's museum, I think one, one story that, that I really tried to, to track down um, in, in that, in that, as part of that history, is there are all kinds of accounts of Native American delegations visiting Peel's museum, which I think again is not something that we necessarily expect for for around 1800. Um, but during visits, during diplomatic negotiations with the federal government, um, you know, there were a few moments where where these groups took actually took a tour of Peel's museum, and there are newspaper accounts of that, um, and we can actually see that. Um, in, in, I mentioned very early on that if you visited Peel's museum, you could, you could get a silhouette taken as a souvenir. Um, and Peel actually made silhouettes of, of this group of visitors, except as part of this group, he wrote down, he's labeling each, each silhouette with the name of the visitor, but there are a couple where he forgot the name and just writes a number. And I think just even in that process, like even in the record keeping of who was visiting, you can see a different kind of loss, right? You see different kinds of erasure. You can see how there's, you know, this, yeah, this kind of larger loss that's taking place um, in terms of what we know, in terms of, you know, who's being um, respected and regarded within this space. Um, and I think that just, I think that those those moments within the project have, have really stayed with me in terms of um, just thinking about, yeah, how we understand this history and also how we how we think about, you know, what it what it means for for institutions today too. An audience member wants to know, can you talk more about the early ties between the Massachusetts Historical Society, the Athenaeum, and the Peabody and other Harvard collections? And what happened to the Barnum collection? Oh. That's a, I mean, that's a really great question. And I'll, I'll say too, that that's something that I've been really interested in, in diving into further in, in some of my future research too, because I do think that, that each of these, um, each of these institutions like has its own, you know, really, really interesting, fascinating history. And I think that those, the processes of deciding what to keep and what to, what to pass on to another institution kind of varied um, from place to place. Um, but, but here's what I know. I mean, I think that if you look, if you spend some time, as I have done, uh, looking through the Peabody Museum catalog at Harvard today, you can actually search um, in their advanced search for, you um, you know, for the Massachusetts Historical Society, for the Athenaeum, you know, for some of these other um, still, you know, still operating institutions for objects that, that have once belonged um, to these institutions and how they ended up at the Peabody. And I think that this story of how, how things moved from institution to institution is a really fascinating one, because in some ways it's like kind of similar to, to this question of, of loss versus preservation. Like this process of deaccessioning is a really interesting one too, because I think that it really speaks to shifting values within, within these institutions. And it, it also speaks to a lot of practical challenges, right? So, you know, do you have space to keep storing and holding on to some of these objects are they better? I think that that's the, there's the practical element there. There's the the rise of disciplinary specialization. So there's this sense that you know some of these collections might have greater value, um, you know, as part of a, a larger collection that's focused on anthropology um, or be interpreted by by the experts. But then there also are often these these kinds of like personal networks, right? So you know, I think that the the ties between different institutions um, often it, it would sometimes come down to to individual figures, um, you know, who they knew, who they were kind of in conversation with. But yeah, I mean, I would say that that I, like I said, I think this is something that I'm I'm hoping to to dig into a little bit more myself too, especially with some of these local institutions. Um, but I think that this this process of deaccessioning is one. Um, yeah, is one that I'm really interested in too. So we have time for one last question from our audience. And I love this question because it's about a moment of creation. So we'll end on that. Um, we've recently acquired a home built during the Revolutionary War and many of the relics that the Soul family residing in this home used until the mid 1900s. The property was the town's first meeting house, tavern, store, school and stagecoach stop. <laughs> 
we are novices with a gold mind. We need advice how to start this process of museum making and what to avoid. So go back in time and tell Peel how to do it, but for the 21st century. That's amazing. Um, I mean, I think that I mean, I think that's that's so interesting. I mean, there there could be so many possible stories there. Um, I guess what I would say is that, you know, I think my own work, like kind of in addition to, to working on this book has involved, you know, teaching with collections, you know, curating different projects. Um, and I think that um, I think there are just so many exciting ways to, to think about these objects and relics that, that you've acquired as part of your house. Um, you know, and I, I think that, you know, for me, it really comes down to, to thinking about like, who are the, who are the people and the stories? Um, and what are the stories that, that you could potentially tell through these objects? Like how might you, you know, use a single one of these relics to, to maybe open up, um, you know, thinking about labor, thinking about um, how people ate, you know, what they wore and what that meant like for their everyday life. And I think that there are just so many um, different and exciting ways to, to think about that. There's so much, you know, interesting work that's done by historians um, as well. Um, but I, I really think that, um, it, that sounds like a really wonderful project of, of thinking about this, this collection, um, but also to, to really think about the, the possibilities for, for illuminating, you know, some of these people who might, might be part of that story. So I hope, I hope this person will report back at some point. Yes, a very useful beginning. So thank you, Reed, and thanks to all of you. And I just want to say uh, thank you to both of you, uh, both uh, Dr. Georgini and Dr. Gutschberg, for a wonderful discussion. Um, and thanks to the audience for joining us. Um, as always, we hope uh, if you found this program interesting, you'll consider buying a copy of the book. Um, so it is uh, available widely. Uh, and we, of course, always encourage people to support locally owned uh, bookstores and or bookshop.org, which supports locally owned bookstores. Um, so um, thank you all for joining us. And without um, anymore. I think we can just wish you everyone a good evening.